Jim Chanos says current stock market bubble is even bigger than the dot-com bubble of the late 1990s. I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over how retail participation has affected the current stock market bubble and how it's increased dramatically since the end of 2019. First of all, commissions for brokerages dropped down to zero. The Fed, the government has distorted the economy. This has pushed people further out the risk curve. It incentivizes them to take more and more risk because interest rates are so low and they can't get a return with bonds, treasuries, something like a safe haven asset, or in their savings account. It also creates an economy where there are not a lot of good paying jobs. The young people today look out into the job market and they don't see a way for them to get ahead and get rich just by working hard. And the petrodollar, the trade deficit of the United States has definitely played into this. That was something I addressed in a video a couple weeks ago. We'll put a link in the description below. But then also the Cerveza sickness has disproportionately affected the United States from the standpoint of our economy is heavily reliant upon domestic services. That's where a lot of our jobs are, especially for young people. So if we go into a shutdown of the entire economy, that's going to disproportionately affect those young individuals that could be looking at the stock market as a way or their only way to get ahead. It's how this works. The Fed comes in, drops interest rates down to 0% by quantitative easing, buying bonds, treasuries, mortgage-backed securities from the banks themselves. We'll call it the commercial banks under the Fed's umbrella. This increases the balance sheet capacity for these banks, meaning they now can lend even more than they could before. They can create more money supply, but they're not going to do it unless the risk reward makes sense. So they look at the real economy and could they take that excess balance sheet capacity and lend to XYZ Corp? Well, yeah, they could, or they could also lend it to the average Joe, maybe to start his own business. But it doesn't make sense because the economy is so distorted. They're not stupid. They see what's going on with the Fed. They know they've only papered over the problem. So instead, they take that balance sheet capacity and go into the repo market. It ends up in the hands of the hedge fund managers and the financial institutions. So a lot of the excess balance sheet capacity of the commercial banking system increases the purchasing power for hedge funds, financial institutions that take that and go into the stock market. They drive prices higher, while at the same time, the retail investor is participating more and more and more because they can't get a return on what little savings they have. Oh, but wait, there is more. <laughs> of course, now you throw into the mix all of these stimulus checks and it takes this bubble into overdrive. As an example of this, something I saw yesterday on my good buddy Grant Williams' Twitter feed, Editor, go ahead and throw up the clip. How to turn your $600 stimmy into $13,000. Stocks to invest in 2021. The first one is Blink, BLNK, the gas station of electric vehicles. Last year, their stock price was just $1.89, and today it sits at $42.75. That's a 2,161% growth. The next one is Square, SQ. Last year, their stock price was $63, and today it stands at $217. That's a 240% growth so far. Lastly, we have Tesla, TSLA. Last year, their stock price, and this is taking into account the stock split, was at $86.05, and today it stands at $705.67. That's an over 700% return. Investing in any one of these three companies will bring you large returns. For more fun in finance and daily live trading, join me for free on my Discord. So for a moment, I want you to imagine you're a millennial or a young person or maybe even Moody the millennial. <laughs> Your job prospects are looking very grim in the real economy, not just because the Fed has distorted everything, created malinvestment 
and a misallocation of resources, but also because we have these shutdowns. So you're getting your $600 STEMI or your $1,200 in STEMI. And of course, you're going to try to parlay that. You're going to take a flyer. You're playing with the house's money. You're going to try to create $13,000. And once you get that $13,000, you're going to do the exact same thing and go for $100,000 or $200,000. Why? Again, it's the only way in your mind that you can get ahead. And then we see the effects of social media. If you saw that clip from the TikTok gal, the investor, she's obviously not telling you to buy things when they're cheap and sell them when they're expensive. She's pointing out how expensive things are, implying how rich you would have gotten if you would have bought those things earlier. This is an insane amount of FOMO. And we have to realize with social media today, we're in a world that's far more connected and we communicate much more with each other, potentially millions of people at a time. And we didn't have this during the dot-com bust. So in my opinion, this is exacerbating the current bubble. When you combine a very poor outlook for opportunity in the real economy, stimulus checks, social media, FOMO, this echo chamber that we now live in with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the fact that 52% of adults aged 18 to 29 are living at home with their parents. It only makes sense. They're taking the stimulus checks they're getting from the government, going right into their Robinhood account and buying whatever has gone up the most over the past six months or year, according to what all their friends are saying on TikTok. Step number two, SPACs, Special Purpose Acquisition Company. This is the second example Jim Chanos gives as to why the current stock market is in even a bigger bubble than it was in the late 1990s. So what is a SPAC? I'm sure you've heard it on CNBC and Bloomberg, but you might not really understand technically how it works. Well, first and foremost, any good SPAC or the ones that are successful <laughs> always have a real famous person promoting it. They're the head or they're the main investor. They're the hedge fund manager, if you will. Technically, they're called a sponsor. Recent SPAC sponsors have included none other than Paul Ryan and Shaquille O'Neal. I heard Shaquille O'Neal and Stan Druckenmiller really have about the same investment skill set. We shall see. But the reason you can have some of these very famous people promoting these special purpose acquisition companies is because the law is much different. Usually when you have an IPO, the head or the CEO of the company can't really go out and talk up the stock before it goes public. There's restrictions there. But with a SPAC, no problem. You can go out on CNBC, Bloomberg, social media, and you can talk it up all you want. Perfect for individuals who have special skill sets, maybe not in investing, but sales. But my concern with SPACs is that most of them are just a shell company. Often they don't even have a business plan. It's just a vehicle that's set up to solicit funds from retail investors to supposedly go out and find a primo acquisition target. So a lot of these specs, in fact, most of them have no profit, no revenue. They don't even have a business, <laughs> but that is no problem. Why? Because they've got a great story. But to understand the technical components of how these SPACs are set up, let's go right to the internet and check out a video clip from CNBC. SPACs are shell companies with no actual commercial operations, but are created solely for raising capital through an initial public offering, or IPO, to acquire a private company. 
This is done by selling common stock with shares commonly sold at $10 a piece and a warrant which gives investors the preference to buy more stock later at a fixed price. Once the funds are raised, they will be kept in a trust until one of two things happen. First, the management team of a SPAC, also known as sponsors, identifies a company of interest which will then be taken public through an acquisition using the capital raised in the IPO. Or second, if the SPAC fails to merge or acquire a company within a deadline, typically two years, the SPAC will be liquidated and investors get their money back. But well, what's the difference between a SPAC IPO and a traditional one? There are several ways a private company can go public. The most common route is through a traditional IPO, where it's subject to regulatory and investor scrutiny of its audited financial statements. An investment bank is usually hired by the company to underwrite the IPO, which usually takes four to six months to complete. This involves roadshows and pitch meetings between company executives and potential investors to drum up interest and demand in its shares. And not all IPOs succeed. Co-working space company WeWork withdrew its high-profile IPO in 2019 amid weak demand for its shares after massive losses and leadership controversies were revealed. Their track records depend on the reputation of the management teams. By skipping the roadshow process, SPAC IPOs also typically list in a much shorter time. So you may be scratching your head right now and asking yourself, George, why would anybody take their hard-earned money and invest it into a shell entity that might not even have a business plan, let alone any revenue? It all goes back to this great story and the total addressable market size. We'll get into that in just a moment with another clip from Jim Chanos himself. But let's use this guy as an example. He is a specialist when it comes to SPACs. His name is Cham SPAC. <laughs> and Cham SPAC, we'll assume he's probably a foreigner, maybe from India, something like that. But he is always on CNBC and he has all the right buzzwords to collect as much money from the market as possible. He has a lot of assets under management and for good reason. He is socially conscious. Everyone sees him or maybe he's branded himself as a disruptor. And boy, is that a buzzword. We need to disrupt everything right now. We need to disrupt food service. We need to disrupt vehicles. We need to disrupt house flipping. We need to disrupt property management. Is there anything that you couldn't generate a billion dollars from by saying that you're going to disrupt XYZ industry? <laughs> I don't know. They've got a fantastic presence on social media. They're very charismatic and extremely intelligent. So why on earth would you not want to give your money to this amazing individual that will obviously make you rich, even though they don't really have a business plan, they don't have a business that generates revenue or profit, but boy, oh boy, don't you worry. Just put your blind faith in me and you'll be all right. And of course, the average Joe and Moody the millennial buy this hook, line, and sinker for all of the reasons we talked about in step number one. So they take their stimmy checks <laughs> that they get from the government and give them right to Cham's bath so he can take them and find his next acquisition target with a fantastic story. And this takes us to our first chart. It starts in 2010, goes all the way to 2020. On the left, we go from $10 billion up to $80 billion. This is the amount of SPAC deals that were done per year. Going back to 2010 and 11, if my memory serves me right from the chart, editor, go ahead and throw it up, there were zero SPAC deals done. So zero dollars generated. 12 and 13 went up a bit. 15, we had a little bit of a bump. 
went back down. Then 18, 2018, it starts to get, I would say, significant up to around $10 billion. 19 up to maybe 11 or 12, but then in 2020, it's up to $73 billion that has been raised for these special purpose acquisition companies. Whenever I see charts like this that are going parabolic, you have to ask the reason why. And often it's because we are in a bubble. But you may be saying to yourself, well, George, that's because they're making all of this money. And guys like Cham Spath have such an awesome track record that my goodness, he's going to blow away the market returns every single time. He is the next Stan Druckenmiller, but he's even cooler because he's socially conscious. Well, let's look at the actual numbers. Here we have some data from recent SPACs that have gone public and their actual returns. Goes from communication down to materials. And this field represents the numbers of deals that were done. And this field represents their returns. We start off really well, 114%, 42%, 10%. But then we drop down and for the majority, they're in the red all the way down to materials at negative 96%. And I'd like to point out the unspecified SPACs, meaning don't worry about what we're going to invest in, just give me your money. That was 29 of the total 93 for a total loss of 21%. So out of the 93 total, they had an average return of negative 9%. But these shockingly bad returns really don't surprise me. Why? Because they don't have an edge. Let me tell you a quick story. Most of you know I was recently in St. Bart's for a couple months visiting my good friend, Hugh Hendry, former hedge fund manager, definitely a legend <laughs> in his own time. That is for sure. But I was able to meet a lot of interesting people hedge fund managers, investment bankers, and people in finance and macroeconomics. And one thing I learned, because a lot of these individuals, I'd meet them and after a couple of beers, I'd say, hey, you should come on my show, the Rebel Capitalist Show. And they'd simply look at me, smile, and say, absolutely not, no chance. And I would always say, why? You've done all these amazing things. You have an incredible track record. You're friends with guys like Jim Rogers and Stan Druckenmiller. You'd be great for my show. And they looked at me in the eye and they said, George, anyone that has an edge in the markets today doesn't want to tell anybody else about that edge. Meaning, if you see someone on CNBC or Bloomberg, 95% of them are there because they know they don't have an investment edge. The only edge they have is in sales. So the way they make money isn't necessarily about taking the money they have under management and increasing the amount of money, return on investment. It's more so about assets under management. The more they can get, the more money they make regardless of what happens to their fund. As an example, if you have an individual that has a billion dollars under management, they'll make a 2% management fee regardless of how much money the fund makes or loses. That's $20 million a year. And if the fund makes money, that's just a bonus. It's like owning a call option where you're being paid $20 million a year. So once we understand that, it becomes blatantly obvious why we see a chart that looks like this. Because those people see that there's froth in the market. They see the frenzy that has been created by the government and the Fed. The frenzy of the retail investor trying to buy more and more and more risk because they think it's their opportunity to get rich with the house's money. So they want to take advantage of this. They might not have a business that they can take public right now. So they're going to create a SPAC at the top of the market 
and take it public as quickly as they possibly can because the process is much faster than a typical IPO to maximize on their assets under management. I think it's extremely important we all understand how the game is played before we try to participate. And for more insight on the SPAC insanity and a specific example of Open Door, let's go right to a clip, one of my favorites, Jim Chanos. There are a, a lengthening list, to your point, just by virtue of the numbers of issues um, you know, out there where it's just, I, you know, I, don't, I don't know what else to say. CNBC trots these people out and they, they pump, their, and pump and dump on their book. I don't know about the dump side, but there's certainly the pumping going on. <laughs> well, the, to talk about SPACs, you also have to marry that with the other concept that's driving uh, the narrative side of the stock market, and that's TAM, um, Total Addressable Market because a lot of the, the, the more egregious SPAC stories are TAM stories, right? That, that there are, there's no profitability, but there is this monster market that if, if their algorithm, their piece of software, whatever it is that's got people excited um, works, that it's just a ridiculous amount of money that they can capture from these giant markets. So think about, think about WeWork, which never got public, uh, uh, disrupting uh, the subleasing of office space. Um, think about uh, Lyft and Uber, which had a TAM, a monstrous TAM when they went public of disrupting basically all types of transportation. Uh, and now you're getting to kind of the, the absurd stuff. Um, and we always look for companies where the business model itself is inherently and structurally unprofitable but they try to dress it up as, a, as a, some sort of network effect TAM story. So consider a recent SPAC by a well-known promoter that is now in the house flipping business. <laughs> and, um, and so they've taken a company that will digitally buy your house and, and, uh, and have built a story around this and merged it into their SPAC. Now we have, we have companies already doing this. Zillow, which is publicly traded, you know, has a house flipping business. Yep and it loses money on every house um, and makes it up on volume. And when you have business models that have discrete money losing aspects to that, that have no network effect, mainly you, you lose money on every widget, but make it up on volume, you have a bad business. I'll be the first person to admit that when it comes to stocks or macroeconomics, I'm merely an amateur. But when it comes to real estate, I'm definitely an expert. So I don't want to go too far off track on this video, but if you want my deep dive breakdown of Open Door from the standpoint of an expert real estate investor that has bought and sold countless homes, many of them sight unseen, just like Open Door <laughs> is trying to do, check out my new YouTube channel. It's Rebel Capitals. We'll put a link in the description below. Step number three, having an edge. I think we can all pretty much agree that we are in a big, fat, ugly bubble. <laughs> to use a quote from Donald Trump himself, we've gone over the retail problem, the SPACs, there's several other that I could list. But I want to also go over what you can learn from this bubble and how you can become a better investor so you can build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments. Okay, so we know the Fed is dropping the interest rates down to zero. That pushes people further out the risk curve. What does that mean though? So check this out. We've got this line that shows interest rates gradually going down from 7%, we'll call that their historic norm, 3.5% and 0% where the Fed has tried to keep interest rates for the majority of the past 12 years. In normal times, you could go into a savings account and collect 7% on your money. So you would be taking very little risk. The Fed drops rates down to 3.5%. Well, now you need to take more risk to get the same 7% return. So you'd probably have to go into stocks as an example. 
you still might be able to get that return or maybe even a better return, but you'd be taking far more risk and the probability of the outcome you desire would gradually decrease as the risk is going up. And this takes us to where we are today, where now instead of stocks, we have people that have to go into companies that are flat out bankrupt, like Hertz, or they have to go into cryptocurrencies. And I'm not talking about Bitcoin in the main one. I'm talking about all these crazy altcoins, or we'll call them S coins, <laughs> or to keep it family friendly, that I see all these young millennials trading till three and four o'clock in the morning. And of course, the SPACs that we went over in step number two, which have a very, very low probability of actually making money. So again, as the interest rates go down, the risk taken to achieve the same results has to go up and the probability of winning goes down. Now let's say the probability of you making money on a specific investment is 45%. Because remember, you've got to take on a lot more risk, therefore the probability goes down. Let's just assume it's 45%. And we'll plug this into one of my favorite tools, which is a binomial calculator. That in and of itself should show you how much of a nerd I truly am at heart. <laughs> <laughs> but a probability of a single trial, again, 45%, the number of trials, basically how many times you toss the coin or make a specific investment or trade, 10, 100, and 1,000, number of successes, which is our break-even point, right at 50%, so that'd be 5, 50, and 500. If we only make 10 investments, our probability of losing money overall is right around 50%. And again, this assumes that initially we have a 45% probability of winning. Our chances of making money, 26%. Once we go up to 100 spins, 100 investments or trades, if you will, our probability of losing money, 81%. Making money, 13%. But once we go up to a thousand, now our chances of losing money is 99.9%. The chance of making money, 0.0006%. And this is the key. If you don't have an edge, a mathematical edge, the law of large numbers is against you. The more you play the game, the greater probability that you lose. If you have a mathematical edge, on the other hand, the longer you play the game, the greater chance that you're going to make money and come out ahead. So in today's world of the everything bubble, where the Fed is forcing retail investors to take more and more risk. Therefore, the probabilities of them making money is always decreasing. As prudent investors, we have to ask ourselves, what is our edge? Do we have a mathematical edge? I would take it a step further. In order to have the mathematical edge, you have to have an advantage over the majority of the other participants in the market. If you're buying Hertz or SPACs or some ICO, what advantage do you have over everybody else that's watching CNBC? Because if you don't have one, the chances are over the long run, you're going to go bust. So what's my edge for George Gammon? It's why I like to buy things cheap and sell them when they're expensive. I like to buy things when everybody else absolutely hates them. They don't want anything to do with it. And I like to sell things when everyone else is jumping on the bandwagon and wants to buy. So what is your edge? Do you even have an edge? Remember, if you don't know who the sucker is at the poker table, 
it's most likely you. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here and I will see you on the next video.